Max. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Master Anatomy.info. Uh, today, you're with Dr. Akang, and I'll be talking about the scalp. All right, so in today's lecture, we'll be looking at um, the different um, dimensions or components of the scalp. We'll look at the topography, then we'll look at the blood supply, the venous drainage, and the lymphatics of the scalp. Then we'll also look at the clinical correlates. So let's cruise. As a matter of introduction, we all know where the scalp is. The scalp is the covering of the cranium, all right? And it's an acronym for uh, actually the things that cover the cranium. And so let's see what this acronym scalp stands for. The skin is the first layer of the scalp. And so it's represented by S, letter S is for the skin. And the C represents the continuous layer. And A represents the aponeurotic layer. And we have another layer called the loose areolar tissue layer, which is L. And then P, the final layer, um, later, pericranium, stands for pericranium. So these five um, layers represent different layers of the scalp or the covering of the cranium. It's interesting to know that they all represent different layers, all right? What you see here, this thing that moves a bit, uh, all right, it has five layers in it. So let's see. So this is the scalp. This is what I'm talking about, all right? So it has um, that uh, point there, all right? Then it has, that's the um, cranium proper, and this is uh, the pericranium, all right? So the skin, just like every other skin is, is thick, but this time around is um, thicker than, a bit more thicker than other areas of the body except the palms and so on. But it has, uniquely it has much hair compared to any area, any area of the body. It has much hair, it's thick, thick hair, right? It also has a lot of sweat glands and sebaceous glands, all right? It has, um, then it has abundant arterial supply and uh, good venous uh, drainage. Then also it has uh, lymphatics drain from it. The next layer is the cutaneous layer, the dense cutaneous layer. Right, it's uh, richly vascularized, uh, okay, and it also has um, a lot of cutaneous nerves within it. That's all about the layer. Then the next layer is the aponeurotica layer. This is uh, a layer that has an aponeurosis, all right, the um, what they call the galli aponeurotica. It's also known as the epicranial aponeurosis that connects two muscles. Um, in front or the ante anteriorly, the frontalis, the frontalis muscle, and also posteriorly, it has the um, um, occipitalis muscle. All right, so I'll show you a picture very soon on how this um, aponeurosis, aponeurosis connects these two muscles. But before we go there, let's look at the different boundaries. All right, let's look at the laterally, this uh, aponeurotica is bounded by the superior uh, uh, temporal lines. All right. Anteriorly, it, is, it has no bony attachment. It just continues with the insert into the frontalis muscle. The posteriorly, it inserts on the external protuberance and also on the superior nuchal lines. All right. So um, now that's the picture of what I was talking about. So you see that that's the aponeurotica. This is the frontalis um, uh, muscle. All right. And this is the occipitalis muscle. Many times, this muscle uh, as a whole is called the occipital frontalis. All right. From here, so here, occipital frontalis, but actually this is the aponeurosis, aponeurosis, all right? And this is the frontalis, this is the occipitalis. So I didn't show you something. I, uh, this is the uh, superior nuchal line, sorry, superior um, temporal lines, all right? And this is the external, um, uh, external occipital protuberance, that's it there, all right? It also has the superior nuchal lines here. All right, so let's continue. And this is the loose areolar tissue layer. And this layer is a very important layer in the study of the scalp. All right, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Let's see. Um, it allows for movement, free movement of the scalp. So every time you do that, your movement of the, you scratch your head, all right, and your, the skin of where your head moves. All right, that scalp that is moving there is because of this um, loose areolar tissue layer that allows for freedom. All right, so it's, uh, it has a little, um, because it's a loose layer, it has a lot of space within it, okay? So the posteri posteriorly, it bounds with the superior nuchal lines and um, uh, laterally, it bounds with uh, the um, superior temporal lines. So it, it appears as if it's following the uh, aponeurotica layer, 
But let's see what happens anteriorly. Anteriorly, it inserts into the eyelids, into the eyelids. So why the aponeurotica would insert into the frontality, this one inserts into the eyelids, right? And simply because the aponeurotica, it has no bony attachment. So it has it, and it was following the things, it has been following from the posterior to the lateral, now to the anterior. Now it has no bony attachment, so it just inserts into the eyelids. All right, now we are continuing. Uh, it's rich with emissary veins. This is one reason. This emissary veins is one reason why this layer is an important layer in the skull, right? The emissary veins, like we all know, emissary veins, emissaries are like messengers, all right? So they are messengers from the intracranium, the intracranial venous sinuses, send them forth into the exterior extracranium, all right? And so they'll always take information. Emissaries will always take information back. So paraventure, there is an infection on the extracranium it's going to take it deep down into the intracranium, all right? And that's why this area, the loose areola tissue layer, is known as the dangerous area of the scalp, all right? And these veins uh, will pass and drain into um, the superior sagittal sinus, the master and the sigmoid sinus, and all that, all the other sinuses. But they carry any infection, whatever they see in the extracranium, they will take it back into the cranium. So uh, infections that should have naturally remained outside would go in there and infect the brain by and large and cause a lot of neuronal disorders. So let's look at the pericranium. The pericranium is just that layer that is attached to the, um, that connective tissue layer that is attached to the um, um, neurocranium or the, co the cover of the neurocranium. All right, but it doesn't, directly attached to the cranium, it attaches to the sutures on the cranium, all right, the sutures, such that if there is an injury, you realize that, um, you realize that if there's an injury to stay within that, um, the bone, it's just going to form like a landmark around the bone, the uh, cranial bone there, all right, so within the sutures, it doesn't move to the other parts, okay, so having said that, let's um, just take a review question. Let's take a review question and see what you've learned so far and how much you can remember. So which layer of the scalp is known as a dangerous area? The skin, aponeurotica, the loose areola tissue, or the pericranium? Which layer, what do you say? Well, if you say skin, you're wrong. If you say the aponeurotica, well, 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 you're wrong. But if you say C, Lose a real tissue, then you are right. The answer is all right. So for more questions like this, all right, you you could subscribe to the masteranatomy.info. Right, if you subscribe to masteranatomy.info, you will find more questions. The monthly subscription where you pay to come and uh, you find lots of questions. You could take out have access to several questions on embryology, questions on um, neuroanatomy questions on um, histology, all right? And uh, you could just use that to prepare yourself for the professional examination, whether it be the ones you want to take in Nigeria or outside the country, anywhere in the world, all right? So that's a good one. So let's continue. Now, lymphatics. The lymphatics of the uh, skull is interesting because um, you realize that lymphatics, the new um, innovation, the blood supply, venous drainage, they happen to be divided into those before, those anterior to the ear and those posterior to the ear. And this is for simplicity, all right? So that you could understand them and uh, it, it makes it teaching very easy. So it also makes comprehension very easy too. So let's see how this is done. The lymphatics anterior to the ear uh, would all drain into the pre-auricular lymph nodes and the parotid nodes, parotid gland nodes, all right? While those posterior to the ear will drain to the posterior auricular, the mastoid, and the occipital lymph node. So, all together, we have like five areas where this thing is drained to on, on each side of the, of, the, um, of the head, all right? On each side of the scalp, right? On the left side, on the right side. Now, and the anterior to the ear, we have two pre auricular lymph nodes and the parotid gland lymph nodes. Posterior to the ear, we have we have posterior auricular, we have the mastoid, and we have the occipital lymph nodes. Okay. So, having known that, let's look at the blood supply. 
All right, anterior to the auricle, we have the supraorbital and supratrochlear arteries. These two are branches of the ophthalmic artery, which is a branch of the internal carotid artery. All right, we also have the superficial temporal artery. Superficial temporal artery, that word there is temporal artery, right? It's a branch of the external carotid artery. Posterior to the ear, we have the posterior auricular and occipital arteries. These are branches of the external carotid artery. Now, both the internal carotid and external carotid arteries, the branches of these arteries would anastomose over the temple, right? Over the temple of the um, um, of the scalp, and this anastomosis allows for um, free blood supply. All right, just in case there is any ligation to any of these arteries, the anastomosis would help to ensure that there is good blood supply to wherever whatever part would have been affected. All right, so let's continue. So this is the diagram showing you the different arteries. All right, different branches. Right, so that's the transverse facial artery and uh, the temporal. Superficial temporal artery I mentioned, okay, and um, the superficial branches. So this is the occipital artery, posterior auricular artery that told the posterior to the ear. All right, and occipital artery again here. All right. So and uh, so that's that's that. Let's uh, make progress as we roll. So the venous drainage. Uh, it follows same way. The uh, supraorbital and supratrochlear veins, all right, would drain into facial vein, and and that it would also drain into the internal jugular vein, right? So the supraorbital, supratrochlear that we saw, supraorbital and supratrochlear artery that we saw um, uh, initially, all right, which we see were uh, branches of the ophthalmic artery and also branches of the internal carotid artery. Now these are um, supraorbital and supratrochlear veins, which are would eventually drain into the internal jugular vein. All right, true. After they are draining into the facial vein, they drain into the internal jugular vein. All right, so let's continue. Now the superficial temporal veins will drain into branches of the facial veins. So they will drain into the maxillary vein. Then from the maxillary vein, it's draining into the retromandibular vein. All right. Then this retromandibular vein, the anterior division. Divide into two. The two maneuvers will have an anterior division and have a posterior division. The anterior division will unite with the facial vein, all right, to form a common facial vein. And this common facial vein will now drain into the internal jugular vein. But see what happens to the posterior division of the retro mandibular vein. The posterior division would unite with the posterior auricular vein to form external jugular vein, right, which will eventually into the subclavian vein, all right? So let's see. And the um, occipital veins terminate at the suboccipital venous plexus, okay? All right, so we have complementary veins that complement the arteries, okay? So this is a diagram showing you the veins, and that's the external jugular vein, and there's an like internal jugular vein, all right? Okay. So, and that's the retromandibular vein. This is the posterior auricular vein and the occipital vein. Okay, uh, so this is the facial vein, that's the facial vein. And you can see the anterior division of the, of the uh, retro mandibular vein going to meet with the uh, facial, uh, branch of the facial vein and form the common facial vein, right? Which will eventually drain into the internal jugular vein. The posterior division now will form with a um, unite with the posterior auricular artery vein, sorry, and drain into the external. Uh, jugular vein. So that just explains what we're talking about uh, in the previous slide. All right, so let's make progress. Um, now, still on venous drainage, there are some set of veins that are that exist within the bones, within the cranium, all right? And they are known as diploid vein, diploid vein, all right? They have this communication with the emissary veins, all right? And they also would eventually drain into the um, the uh, the dura venous sinus. Okay, so we see down that the frontal diploid vein would emerge in the supraorbital notch, right, and uh, it, um, it would drain into the supraorbital vein. 
So these deploy greens have this relationship with the venous drainage, all right? Though they are within the cranium, they are both veins that stay within the bones, right? The anterior temporal deploy vein would also drain and end at the anterior deep temporal vein, or sometimes the spinal uh, parietal sinus. Posterior temporal deploy veins would end in the transverse sinus, and we also have the occipital deploy veins, which would open up into the occipital veins, some other times the transverse sinus. Let's look at the innervation of this nerve. And remember my rule that they are um, supply, the supply before the, or anterior to the auricle and posterior to the auricle. So here we have 10 nerves on each side, 10 nerves on each side. We have five anterior to the auricle and five posterior to the auricle. Five posterior to the auricle. Okay, so we um the supra the supra trochlear and the supra orbital nerves. And let's look at the trying to talk about the ones anterior to the auricle now. I said five anterior, five posterior. So let's see. Supra trochlear, supra orbital nerves. These are branches of the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve. We also have the auriculotemporal nerve, which is a branch of the uh, mandibular uh, nerve. All right, and we have the zygomatic facial nerve, which is a branch of the zygomatic nerve. Note, these four are sensory nerves, okay? But we also have, we also have the motor division, which is um, from the temporal branch of the facial nerve, the temporal branch of the facial nerve, which gives the uh, motor division for the nerves, the five nerves anterior to the ear. The ones posterior to the ear are five, two. We also have four sensories and one motor. The first is the um, great auricular nerve, while the other ones are occipital nerves, lesser occipital nerve, greater occipital nerve, third occipital nerve. All right, third occipital. So we have great auricular nerve, and the rest are uh, occipital nerves, which we have lesser, greater, and third occipital nerve. Right. The motor division is from the um, facial nerve too, all right? So both motor uh, divisions, both the ones anterior to the ear and posterior are from the facial nerve. Of course, because they supply the muscles of facial expression. They also supply so, and the frontalis and the um, hospitalis are muscles of facial expression, all right? So that's um, a diagram showing you the nerves, okay? So immediately let's go into the clinical correlates. One of them is what I've emphasized on before now, which has to do with um, the um, emissary veins taking infection from the extracranium to the intracranium. But these other ones, I, I, I didn't talk about them in full. I talked about point one, pericranium, because of its um, adherence to the um, sutures. When there is cephalohematoma, that's blood on the, on the um, uh, cranium or something like that, it stays within that pericranium area. It stays within that suture, all right? And form the shape of the bone concern, right? Now, collection of blood in the layer of loose um, areolar tissue, all right, may extend into the, since there's no point for it to extend posteriorly and laterally, may extend into the um, eyelid and form what they call a black eye, right, anteriorly, because it has no bony attachment. So it's, that's it's that escape, escape point. It goes right there, right? So I talked about um, uh, loose area that has been the dangerous area. Now wounds in the scalp could bleed profusely uh, if the scalp is, um, uh, if the cut is transverse, there could be profuse bleeding. But if the cut is, if the cut is um, longitudinal or sagittal, right, the uh, bleeding will not be that profuse because of the, um, the way the, um, the scalp fibers run, the, Aponeurotica, all right? But when once it's transverse, and because of the way the fibers run, it will open it so wide and the bleeding will be very profuse. So it's important to note that. Now, other clinical coilates include tinea capitis, where we could have ringworm because of um, fungal infection, right, on the um, hair, on the scalp, right? And that's um, the that's picture. Right? We could also have uh, pediculosis capitis. We have lice, a lot of lice invading the hair because maybe the hair, and this happens a lot to farmers and all that, or at least not take care of their bushy hair. 
but yet don't take care of it properly. So lice could invade there and find, find it a very comfortable place to live in. Uh, sooner or later, they will begin to have a lot of itching on the hair, on the scalp, and all that. And if properly checked, you can find that there are lice with it. So it could also be treated by uh, uh, um, some using some creams that could help um, reduce this lice and also insect um, the bleating of the whole entire house. All right. Okay, so that every cushions and all those things are changed to ensure that even the whole family should also be um, taken care of so that it doesn't spread because they have their way of hiding with cushions and, and bed sheets and all that. So, wow, you've done so well listening to this lecture to the end. I'd like you to subscribe to our masteranatomy.info, okay, to assess um, lectures, they are free, but the questions, so quizzes to get to get um, acquainted with these quizzes. The more acquainted you are with these quizzes, the better you get in your anatomy. So thank you so much for listening to us. I'll, 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 I want you to listen to another lecture, all right, and get much better in your anatomy. See you next time.